Professor Ocobo, can you move a little bit? He spent a chunk of his time actually writing this book. It's very unique. It's probably one of its kind. And I don't think there's any there other book. Many, yeah, on the topics, yeah. And so when you research on social banditry, and this is the one that deals with Juan. Juan. Cortina. Well, thank you again for having me back. It's a pleasure to be in class because I only teach online and I miss, I miss being with you face to face with the students. Um, but at any rate, I, a couple of weeks back, I was here talking about the events that led to the Mexican-American War and more in particular, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, correct? And so the treaty we said back then had two main objectives. One was to end the war and one was to establish civic and property rights of the former Mexican nationals. So again, it's important to put ourselves in context, and you have people, people who are Mexican nationals back then, Mexican people, correct, who, uh, as we might have said, did not move. They, they were in the same house, same street, same town. They moved no, nowhere. But from really one day to the next, if you will, they were in a different country, right? In fact, there's a, a, a book entitled Foreigners in Their Native Land, and it's, it really sort of encapsulates how Americanos back then felt in what was now the American Southwest. They were home, but they were foreigners in their native land, right? So things changed completely. Different government, different social, political, and economic realities, uh, religious intolerance, racial intolerance. So if you think about how you might have felt back then, or well, let me ask you that question. How would you feel uh, if there was a war, you're on the losing side of that war, correct? In a sense, you are, living in a uh, sort of a strange new world, even though you are, in a sense, still in the same home. W would you be concerned? Would you be scared? Any, any thoughts about that? Confused. What would worry you? Confused. Maybe confused, exactly. You know, what, what, what laws apply now, correct? Uh, what are my rights, per, you know, perhaps, now? What's the future of, of my, for my family, for our properties, right? So that's why when we looked at those articles, Articles 8 and 9 in particular, they're so important. They cover civic and property rights, correct? and we have a chance if I want to go back and visit those. So it, there is indeed a very um, violent period in the post-war era, right? So following the Mexican-American War, you have the end of hostilities between both the U.S. and Mexico, right, as nations, but now you have, in a sense, sort of a civil war that, that begins in the American Southwest between Mexican origin people who feel themselves, again, unprotected by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right? Uh, and they feel attacked, in fact, especially as land becomes more and more desired by, by incoming immigrants from other parts of the United States and other parts of the world. So how do you react? How would you react to, to violence? Uh, physical violence, economic, political, social violence. How do you respond to that? There are a number of ways perhaps one can respond to that, but double violence, correct? One is assimilation. If you can, you might want to assimilate right, to the new social order. Uh, in fact, I was uh, noticing Professor Gomez wrote the word Hispanic. That is more like a 1970s word, right, that is actually created to try to encapsulate populations, right, of Mexican ancestry, Latino ancestry, I'm sorry. But the word Hispano with an O actually appears in the 1870s, right after the Mexican-American War. The word Hispano appears. And that word was used by people uh, in order to try to de-emphasize Mexican ancestry and emphasize what kind of ancestry you think. What does the word suggest, Hispano? In other words, we're not Mexicans, we are, what do you think? More like Spanish, correct? So the word Hispano really came as a result of the pressure, right, to escape violence, or to try to perhaps be in a better position, socially, politically, economically, in the new social order. So people said, no, no we're, not, we're not Mexicans, we are Hispanos, okay? Now, Again, if you study your history, you'll know that it, there was an anti-Spanish sentiment also, Hispanophobia, right? But it was better to be Spanish than to be a Mexican, okay? In that, in that sort of, uh, you know, category, if you will. Uh, in fact, um, you know, you have this, uh, this, this pressure again to deny really, you know, who you were. Now, this did not work for everybody. Only certain people could claim to be Hispanos. Who do you think those folks were? Mostly by skinned people, exactly. The Californios that were from the upper classes, that might have been uh, by coincidence or not, right? Lighter skinned, you know, Mexicanos or Cali we call them Californios, no? 
And so they were able to assimilate. They had been already, some of them, their families had already been exposed to American families or traditions because they received education in the United States. There was trade between the old Californios, perhaps in American the corporations. So for them, it was easier to assimilate. And therefore, we see, again, this idea uh, of, of uh, separating themselves, right, from the Mexican, uh, what, we call, what was called by him, uh, los pelados, you know, the, the masses, the people. Yeah? Uh, and saying again, we are Californios, we are Hispanos, we're not necessarily like the, Me the other Mexicans, right? So it's in a sense a survival mechanism. Chicano historians like Rodolfo Acuña, who's uh, the godfather of Chicano studies, uh, came up with a term called the fantasy heritage. I don't know if you heard that before, but uh, again, the fantasy heritage was sort of, not pedrada, digamos, like a little stone thrown at these people, saying, well, you know, you might look you know, different, but you really are you know, Mexicanos. You, know? you are part of this cultural mestizaje that has occurred you know, uh, in, in what is now you know, then Mexico. Uh, so the idea of fantasy heritage was that people were basically denied who they were just to be able to get ahead in life somehow, right? And there's a lot of to that even in today's, right, uh, let's say cultural conflicts, you know, when it comes to Mexicanos, Mexico-Americanos, no? Um, in fact, uh, you know, if you think about this, um, there's this phrase in, in, in Mexico, in Mexican culture, uh, that, that is almost making fun of this kind of situation, and that is, tienes el nopal pintado en la... Frente, right, which in English makes no fucking sense, but you know this idea that you have a cactus painted on your on your forehead, right? When someone says that to you, they're basically saying, well, you know, you might want to call yourself Rudy instead of Rodolfo, right? uh, Jacob instead of Jacobo Gonzalez, but that's just sort of your way of dealing with something that is that is you know uh, you're unable to deal with that apparently, right? There's a, something that is uh, traumatized you to that extent that you're denying who you really are, right? But if you if you look this way, most likely this is who you are. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, there were studies done at SMU of those populations of their descendants uh, that uh, were genotype, phenotype studies, that the results rendered were that in fact, many of these people who were descendants of these families were indeed mestizos, right? but they happened to be ladder, ladder skin mestizos. But really the point is that the pressure that is there for us to deny who we are. Do you see that in contemporary society, you think, today? Do people do that? You know, I think people still do that, a little bit of that, correct? Whether it's switching our last names or, or, or perhaps denying, you know, where we live. Or, I mean, there's a pressure, of course, that's, that is there, correct? Any examples? Anyone want to join the, the talk today? No? Okay. Well, I, I'm pretty sure they're there. I, I, you know, I, I've seen those. So, if one way is to, to respond to the violence is to basically assimilate or deny that who you are. Another way, perhaps, is to support active rebellion, right? And that did also occur, right? And you can support rebellion either by simply supporting someone's movement, it could be simply a verbal support, or joining an actual cause. Not by surprise, we have in this post-war period in the American Southwest, the emergence of the social banditry, right, a, a idea or concept. And you might have a, a video, I think in your class, I'm sure Gomez here uh, might have talked about it, but this idea of the social bandit is quite interesting, right? Because almost every society has them across human history. It is the individual, he or she, that basically uh, is, is the um, rises against the oppressed right, system or mechanism, correct? So again, uh, it's not someone that is just a bandit, like social banditry, the word bandit suggests crimes, correct? But it's someone that actually is committing a crime with a social political objective. That, that's the difference, correct? So it's not just me robbing or stealing for my own benefit or my own enrichment, but there is a political social action, or the masses, the people, are interpreting my action as having a social political agenda. Does that make sense? Yes, right? So it's, it's got a purpose behind it. It's not just me getting a fit, I want to be rich. I, I'm doing it for a cause, or well, it's interpreted as having, of course, a social political uh, cause. And this is the case with a lot of these folks that we see uh, being social bandits. I know Professor Gomez is doing a few documentaries on this topic. Uh, you know, you have uh, Joaquin Murieta, Pibu Lucio Vasquez, El Rego Vaca. Yeah, they, they already yeah, all that stuff you read, okay? So you have all the, again, they're like the Robin Hoods, right? In the, in the English uh, literary tradition. You take from the rich and you give to the poor. It's the rage against the machine, correct? Uh, and so people support them in a number of ways. You can see uh, corridos, you talked about corridos in class. Uh, you talked not, about, not yet, not yet, okay, well. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, corridos are, are folk songs, correct? 
Uh, and if you are of Mexican descent, you probably heard them all your life. And when you're a kid, again, you hate them. When you turn 40, you love them for some fucking reason. I don't know. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, they're, they're songs that tell a story, right? In fact, uh, you have historians, uh, musicologists, um, ethnomusicologists like, like your mentor, Pepe Villarino, um, Américo Paredes. Paredes, exactly, who, who studied you know, these, these songs, right? And so they found them to be salud, very historically accurate, taking into account their, their vista or their own bias. Uh, we know that these documents, um, when you compare them to newspapers, to legal, uh, let's say, documentation, that they actually are quite accurate, right? And so they, they tell you who, what, where, when something happened, right? En 1911, les voy a contar muy bien, right? You heard that one, no? No? Yes. Okay, me too. So, anyways, they tell you a story. This is what happened, here's where it happened, here's what occurred. You take that, that song and compare it to other sources, it's fairly accurate, again, taking into account the different position, the different vista of the individual that is composing the song, writing the document, right? So, one of these important social bandits is a man named Juan Cortina. And uh, his story is quite different from that of Murieta in California, uh, or perhaps uh, others like Ethel Bobaca. And that uh, he was an, actually an individual that came from a fairly uh, established and financially well off family in Texas, okay, in Texas. And uh, Texas was a particular area of conflict regarding the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, for what reason? Does anyone remember what reason uh, is Texas, particularly, let's say, an area where potential conflict with Mexicanos could take place when it comes to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? Any ideas? Mm. Okay, so we know Article 8 and 9 try to establish civic and property rights. We know, in fact, there was an Article 10, right, that was deleted because it protected all land grants, okay? Uh, but part of the debate was whether or not Texas was indeed covered by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, correct? That was part of the big debate back then, okay? Even now, I guess, in academia, uh, that's the question. So, put it this way. If people in California, uh, let's say like Botillier, or I'm sorry, but like uh, Joseph Ives de Montour, uh, or the Botillier case with Dominga Dominguez, if people in California had very few rights, even though the treaty was very much, let's say, um, applicable to California, in Texas things would be much worse because the treaty wasn't even covering at all California. I mean, I'm talking about Texas, right? Texas was an area where American government um, uh, took the position that it was not part of the treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, right? that there were certain articles that would cover it because it was a part of a, of a nation of the United States, but it was not part of the negotiations that involved in particular Articles 8 and 9 that protect the civic and property rights. So what does that mean if you're a Mexicano in Texas? Yeah, you don't become a citizen. Yeah, it's sort of even more, you said earlier, confusing, yeah. ambiguous, right? There's even less protection. So in California, it's, it's already confusing enough if you consider the people versus the La Guerra case in 1869, so we're already confusing. When does one become a citizen? What rights do I have? Is my property protected, right? Uh, all this is a problem, huge problem in California. Let alone now you have a, a Texas that joined the Union according to the United States before the war started. So it's a complete different, this every world package, right? So naturally in Texas, you're gonna have a lot of anger and frustration, especially as you begin to have the loss of land by the Mexicano community. In the case of Juan Cortina, the story goes that his mother tried to seek the advice of an attorney, and in doing so, she signed what she thought was actually a power of attorney, right, later, and what she actually signed was a, a, a bill of sale for her property, okay? For a, uh, a, a the story is that it was a, a dollar, something like almost ridiculous, right? So she thought she was doing something, right? and signing something, a power of attorney, and she was signing a bill of sale. Obviously, that's gonna, that's gonna make you very angry, correct? Uh, and that begins this, this uh, uh, frustration with the Cortina uh, family in particular, with the Texas state government, but also the United States government, the federal government, right? The lack of protection for Mexicanos. Well, but what really sets this whole thing off with Cortinistas, or Juan Cortina in particular, is that one particular day in Brownsville, he sees uh, a Mexicano male that is being beat up by, by the sheriff, almost killed by the sheriff. 
uh, to, you know, uh, not gold pizza, right, a beating, uh, and he intervenes, asking the sheriff if he will allow, be allowed, him, Cortina, to take uh, the man with him, right? Uh, and so there was an exchange of words, an exchange of gunfire, and you know that song, who shot the sheriff? It was Juan Cortina, okay? There is a shootout, he shoots the sheriff, the sheriff gets killed. And so, again, if you notice all these stories like, like Murieta and others, um, uh, Vasquez. Vasquez. What's the one with um, Diego Vaca? Gregorio Cortez. Okay, Gregorio they Cortez. all involve law enforcement and the community. Boom, having a collision. Okay, all the, in this in the same period, right? And so uh, that immediate action uh, where he kills a sheriff uh, obviously sends him to um, uh, flee, right, for his life, if you will. But in the process, he becomes a folk hero, right? And all these social bandits become folk heroes in this context, right? They're seen again as, you have to be really careful with this because it's not like you like someone that, like, that commits crimes, right? But you're, like, you're looking at someone that you feel is fighting back and against what's oppressing you, what's keeping you down. That's really how you have to sort of look at this in a, in a different context. Um, so Juan Cortina uh, flees, but very soon begins to have followers. And again, this is different from the other cases like Murieta, uh, Cortez, because those were individuals, right? In this case, this guy finally becomes, you know, a member of a leading military unit. We, 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 before you know it, he has 500 people that are following him in Texas uh, that support him because they feel the exact same way, because they lost land, because they've been hurt, because they lost someone to violence. Uh, the uh, history of the Texas Rangers violence against the Mexican community is, is, is it's very huge, it's, it's sad, it's, it's brutal. And so uh, everyone in Texas could talk about violence against them by law enforcement, let alone other people, individuals again in Texas. Actually, the, the, the law enforcement itself. So this again leads to him having a lot of followers, uh, and you have um, people that were not just Mexicanos, but not by coincidence, people from South America, African Americans, American Indians. Uh, he had Jewish Americans that supported him. He had basically a, a, a army by him, of himself. It became so powerful that they really took control of South Texas. You know, Brownsville was sort of like their capital. They controlled the entire South state, uh, southern part of the state of Texas for, for, for years. Um, and both the U.S. and Mexico were like, well, sort of confused about how to deal with this individual again in the borderlands that has so much power. Uh, but at the same time, you have the Civil War uh, you know, begin and take place, and so you have a situation where both the American South, the Confederacy, wanted to have him on their side. And you have then uh, a Confederacy shipment of uh, uh, all things, weapons, um, money, and whiskey, for some reason, uh, that were provided to Cortina's, well, we came Cortina's army, because it really was like an army, right? And so they, again, were not an individual or a small group of people, there were hundreds of them that got organized, that were well armed, uh, well equipped, uh, and, they, um, and they had plenty of also to drink, you know, in case they were thirsty, I guess, you know. Uh, and so uh, the South supported him, and in fact, here's the ironic part, this guy was quite interesting. Yeah. They made him a general in the Southern Confederate Army, okay? This is the South. Well, after the Battle of Vicksburg, uh, and Texas uh, began to uh, lose, of course, its, its uh, uh, let's say Confederate uh, support. Uh, the Union made him a general in the Union Army, right? So this guy was a general for both the South and the and the North of, uh, the, in, during the war, right? Again, that makes no sense whatsoever. But he didn't didn't care. He was trying to survive the larger conflict, and they were giving him money, again, weapons, and apparently once again whiskey from both sides, right? So he's just taking everybody's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, money and, and uh, bullets and just sort of surviving the period. He had I have a, a quick question. Yeah, please. Are, um, did he sympathized with the South or the North? Uh, no, we have no evidence that like, he sympathized with the South at all. And I, he saw in general the United States as, as the enemy of the Mexican people, you know, North or South. Okay? Uh, he would say that no Mexicano could, leave, could live in peace as long as there was this, any one of these you know, governments present. So he was very, very uh, anti American in some ways. Okay? And I'll talk about that in one second because it's quite interesting. So, ironically, now at the same time you have in Mexico the French intervention, right? That comes into Mexico, overthrows the Mexican government, 
Uh, Benito Juarez says in Ciudad Juarez escaping the violence or that t uh, turmoil. And guess what? The French in Mexico make him a general in the French Imperial Army. And the Mexican government make him a general in the Mexican Liberal Army. So he was a general for like all these different uh, uh, armies that were fighting each other in Mexico and in the United States. But the guy, I repeat, was more focused on Texas. That was his whole thing, Texas, right? Well, when the war ends, in the Civil War and uh, in Mexico, also the, the, uh, the Civil War as well, you have a problem now be between the U.S. and Mexico because now you have Porfirio Diaz, uh, who's looking at the United States as, as a natural partner when it comes to you know, the future of Mexico. Uh, and you have this Mexicano Tejano, Cortina, his army, that are controlling South Texas, well armed, again, well equipped, uh, and, uh, and willing to fight. Okay? So the United States wanted to try to just capture him and kill him. Mexico did not want that because he was seen as a hero to the Mexican people, right? So they uh, basically set a trap, uh, they meaning the Mexican United States government, where they capture him, but Mexico gets to him soon and takes him down to Mexico City, right? And they will put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, they, they, he gets married to a really young wife. I guess he was like 17, 16 years old. He was already in his 70s, okay? And say, so you're going to be under house arrest, you know? Here's, you know, your wife. Uh, and, you know, this, here's all these accommodations. It's interesting because, again, even when he dies, they bury him with full military honors, but in a tomb. I got to go see the tomb that, uh, uh, that was not even marked at the beginning because... The Mexican government knew that the United States basically saw him as, as basically like, like a terrorist in a sense, right? Uh, Anti-American, uh, and but the Mexican people saw him as heroic because of his actions again uh, in Texas. So eventually, the uh, he is uh, given an opportunity to come back just to visit, a uh, pardon, you know, in the long run uh, by the United States government because they understood the actions or the grievances that they had against the Mexican American government. But the story of Juan Cortina. Really, it's quite, again, in some ways similar to the other social bandits because people were, again, uh, felt victimized. They feel that they've lost their rights, they lost their property, their, their livelihoods, right? And, uh, uh, but different in the sense that, again, it actually became a, a, an actual military unit. Uh, they had spies. They had a whole uh, female women's unit called Las Damas Aguilas that functioned as spies, right, in Brownsville. And so it was, again, quite a, a force that had to be uh, dealt with. And so uh, one of the things, I, if you have a chance to uh, Google one of these days, is Google the Corrido of Juan Cortina, Gregorio Cortez. And again, they talk about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they talk about land being lost. Um, their, his biggest enemy was, in fact, the Texas Rangers, right, Los Rinches de Texas, because they worked um, as a unit for the oligarchy in Texas, right, for the rich in Texas. And those rich people in Texas really became wealthy by stealing Mexican land or Mexican horses, Mexican cattle. So again, it, it speaks volumes about this very violent period in the American Southwest. And it does leave, again, uh, legacies right way into the, into the uh, present. Uh, in the 90s and even early 2000s, uh, there were attempts by scholars to uh, equate the cartels also as social bandits, right, because some of the actions that were being done by like Caro Quintero and others where they, I was, they were criminals, but they were also providing, uh, you know, uh, fire ambulances or hospitals to small ranchos or towns. But obviously, uh, you know, there's others who feel that was not the, the, the right comparison. But it is, again, something that tells us what that environment was in that post-war period. A, a very violent, a very uh, scary time, if you happen to be of Mexican descent in American Southwest. And then really, again, if you look at it long, historically, uh, we can look at the law enforcement, right, the, uh, the legal system in the United States, and how it's perceived by, by the uh, Mexican people, uh, people of Mexican descent in the United States. There's always been a, a sense of, of uh, mistrust that is there between the community and, and law enforcement. And it really goes back to these, these conflicts, uh, again, back then, um, you know, in the 18... Uh, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, early, early 1900s, where the law enforcement in the United States became an arm of the oligarchy, right? They were there to suppress, attack the Mexican community, you know, versus, again, or supporting the, uh, the uh, rich people in Texas in this case. So, you know, when I grew up, for example, 
uh, there was always that fear of the police, even though I hadn't done anything, but it's like, uh, you know, I've been la policia, my mom was, what the hell, it's like, venga la cabrón. It's like, but we're always being told to be scared of the police. I don't know if you grew up in that kind of environment, but for me, it's always the case. La policia, la policia, or la, la migra, whatever, right? And so, you get, uh, you grow fearful of, of the legal structure, right? It's, it's, it's arms to do well, um, based on those experiences historic. That's a long story, but uh, any questions about Juan Cortina? But they, there's, oh. they should be able to answer at least one, two, oh. number three, they had a long time ago, but um, I think who were Las Mujeres Cortinistas or something that... Yeah, so they were called Damas Aguilas. So one of the things, so let me tell the story behind the book. Um, uh, By the way, those of you coming late, Professor Acobo is reviewing his own book, he wrote this book of Chendo Cortina while he was at New State. Yeah. It's, it's probably the only book right now in the U.S. and he's very humble. So this is awesome that we have the writer here. So it was one of my 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> there were several newspaper articles on, on this topic and, uh, uh, but yeah, there was, so these mujeres, the story was this, the, this guy, uh, his name was, is Carlos Larrarde, was doing his, uh, also his PhD at UCLA. And uh, with the assistance of Richard Wurzel Castillo, we got together and, 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 and uh, used uh, these sources. Turns out that his grandfather had been an attorney in Texas, and they had kept all these documents, right, that were part of that Cortina struggle. So we had all these primary sources. It was very rich. They had their own money for a while. It was just crazy, right? Uh, and um, so one of the things that we found were all these le letters from these mujeres, these, these um, women, uh, in the late 1800s, again, that wrote about why they joined the cause, right? It was, again, amazing, an amazing wealth of material. And they all documented about how they had been um, victims of, unfortunately, sexual assault, right? Uh, by the new, by, by the, some of the immigrants or by the law enforcement. Uh, they had lost husbands, children, sons uh, to the violence in Texas. And they refused to, to just... Um, Surrender, if you will, right, as victims, but they wanted to be uh, active in the in the resistance in Texas, and so they became, um, uh, you know, uh, soldiers. In, in fact, uh, in in the in the literature, uh, they call themselves, and this is what they call themselves. Okay, don't slap me. They call themselves burras, you know, and but you know, which but which means like female donkeys. But it wasn't trying to be offensive. They call themselves that because they carried stuff into the battlefield and carry out the sick or the wounded, were carrying ammunition, you know, uh, food. Uh, but a lot of them became nurses, and a lot of them actually became uh, soldiers themselves. And so when we think about La Adelita, I don't know if you've heard of Adelita before, or female soldiers from the Mexican Revolution, in some way these were the precursors that they came before that. They were women who actually dressed themselves as men in, in cases to go into battle uh, to fight against the Texas Rangers. And again, the main enemy that they had was the Texas law enforcement, the, the rangers, right? Los rinches de Texas, they call them, right? Which we hear often in corridos, uh, that word. Uh, but um, uh, Laura, Laura Leona was one of them, for example. They, uh, she, again, was a spy, uh, would go in and try to, you know, gather information from the rangers, from American for military forces in Texas. But again, they were not passive victims, right, of the violence. They, they decided to fight back in any way that they could. Uh, most of the resistance was, was ended after the um, uh, Cortina was removed from, um, from, from uh, Brownsville, Texas. But there were other, again, em emergencies of similar violence that occurred, resistance. Uh, most notably, they have a chance to read a book called With His Pistols in His Hand. It's a story of Gregorio Cortez. It's a good film that uh, was made by, uh, about that. No, uh, in the one or two class. One or two class. And, um, um, it was played by James Edwards Olmo, no? He mm -hmm. plays that, yeah. that, that, that part. So it's a pretty good little film about, uh, again, that, that period. And again, it's just, um, you know, you have to try, I think the thing about history is to try to make parallels or try to see if something was learned or not learned right into the present. Uh, I would say to you that uh, in my perspective, okay, that there's still a very strong anti-Mexican sentiment, often in the United States, anti-immigrant sentiment, cultural collision that is there. You know, that, uh, you know, when people talk about um, uh, invasions from the South or, or crime, you know, uh, recently I, I was listening to uh, the former uh, President uh, Trump talk about running for the presidency again, and I don't know if you heard the speech, 
but very similarly he says things like the border is open is out of control well that causes fear right of the other right like, and so some people might might uh, feel that their lives are being threatened uh the drugs are pouring across it creates this imagery of the other as uh, some someone or something that threatens your your existence right? and therefore reaction is is required or is needed the border has always been a very violent border always has been right uh, when professor gomez and i were younger at, at the university talking about this uh, the men and men, right, were the, you know, the, the, the uh, there was all these different groups that would patrol the border, right? They still do. They still do, right? And there were others that uh, let out the border campaign in 94. Uh, again, this, uh, it's a border that's been very much uh, a source of conflict, like many borders, unfortunately, throughout the world are, right? Here's an example of, a, again, post-war, post-treaty uh, social violence that occurred in mainly in the American Southwest. And, any other questions that you might have? I don't know what's going on fast. No? You're missing who oh. were the angels of mercy? The angels of mercy were, were the, uh, they were also the women that, again, were mainly the curanderas, right? So they were, they were nurses, they were curanderas, uh, there were no doctors around, so they had to do what they could to try to save uh, soldiers' lives, right? Uh, and uh, again, there were women that were not necessarily trained in this, uh, and uh, risk their lives to try to, uh, uh, you know, save the, the lives of the Mexicano, uh, uh, Mexican American soldiers. Or again, they were zero soldiers. They were not Mexican soldiers. Okay, they, we have to be careful with that. They were basically Mexican American soldiers of the Cortina Army that were fighting against the uh, the Rangers primarily. 